Hello, universe. <clears throat> I, uh... I'm all over the place. Matter of fact, let's try to put four things down. Ah, might have to kill him this real quick. Mm, I lost him. I will say, as opposed to the Miller Moth, this summer the Mosquito has definitely uh, ah, gained more respect than I thought it could even possibly achieve in terms of a foe after my blood and my defense mechanisms to offset his efforts. And I say him because, let's face it, if you're a blood-sucking insect, you're a him. Um, well, do any of us think I've smoked enough weed at this point? Considering the answer to the question, how much weed have you smoked, would be, <sighs> not enough. I'm going to go smoke some weed before we get back to the recording. Clickety-clack, clickety-clack, now you're in place, so pause. Um, unpause. Four topics for tonight. Uh, money crunch, uh, mail crunch, uh, should we throw cap and crunch in there? Maybe, but we won't call that a topic, we'll call that a distraction. Uh, after that will come, um, boy, I had, I had two more. What were the other two? <sighs> pause. Okay, stand-up comedy was the third... Maybe work was the fourth, or lack therein, but that has to do with money. Um, the fourth could have been feminism, but that has to do with with male crunch. So, um, I don't know what the fourth was. Maybe it was mosquitoes, because goddamn, are mosquitoes ever smart? How do they know how to get behind you, no matter what direction you are? Did they see your eyes? The one that's buzzing in my ear right now. I gotta, oh, and so if you want to uh, survive a mosquito infestation, you have two assets, none of which is bug spray. That shit does not work. Nor does Skin So Soft or any of the other alternatives, nor does vinegar, nor does any of it. What works is a fan. Mosquitoes don't have enough strength to fly through the air currents. If you point fans away from yourself, they won't be able to fly into you, and the few that can get through, you should be able to deal with. Because two is a spray water bottle. Now, I will admit that I've taken a little more pleasure in drowning mosquitoes this summer than I, as a soulful creature, should. But, oh my God. It works. And the... Number one defense of a mosquito when targeted is to fly into a dark background, which is where you'll lose them immediately. And then they will fly either to the ceiling or the floor to evade your natural eyesight line of head level. And most of them fly to the ceiling. So always look for them up. And then they will fly to your back and try to come at you from behind. They're clever little fuckers. So if you know this, then you can take your water bottle, follow the pattern that they follow, spray in that area, and they will run into your storm and eventually fall to the ground. So, yes, it's satisfying to slap one while it's biting your elbow. Bam! Leave it on your palm in that bloody little smear. But if you really want to deal with mosquitoes at the goddamn commercial level, get a water bottle. And I don't mean a squirt water bottle. I mean like a Windex water bottle. And just fill it with water and be ready to attack. Because they're coming. So that they can lay their eggs and have more of them. Anyway. I don't know how you deal with Miller Moss. Disgustingly. Because those things are too big to squish with your hand. No, I don't squish any bugs but mosquitoes. But boy, do I make up for all the other not bug squishing when it comes to squishing a mosquito. Some of my... Um, some of my real uh, questionable moments this summer have involved literally drowning them in the shower. Taking pleasure in that. That's the part that's questionable. Um, I did accidentally drown a Miller Moth, but that was his fault mostly. Actually, I didn't even really drown him. I murdered him before he could drown. Um, but if you want to know that story, go listen to another podcast or two, because somewhere back there is where I tell it. And I guess this is a good time to get into what I haven't covered for a while, which is why you should not be listening. 
Or how about this? If you're going to choose to listen, you're going to choose to put up with certain idiosyncrasies that I can't help because this isn't a polished effort to ascribe some new uh, way of living to the world. No, this is a bumblefuck apology for having pissed away some of my life's opportunities in ways that I thought at the time were just negligible, but turned out to have been fairly meaningful. And having seen opportunities to make a better world and not having made one, well, it's my fault that we're trapped in this chaotic shit storm of a life that we're living. So, obviously you're going to put up with some swearing, because to me, don't invent a word that we're not going to be able to use that's dumb. So, I like language. I am a fan of linguistic structure. I am specific with my word choices because what I say now, I will stand by whenever you want to bring it up. If I have changed my opinion from now till then, well, I will reflect upon who I used to be and the changes that have precipitated the new person that has this opinion now. I'm an evolving mental creature just like you. But I stand by what I say because otherwise I wouldn't say it. So when it comes to swearing, it's the width of the language that I'm most enamored with. I don't want to sit and think of seven, 17, 700 words that are too raunchy to say, too off-color to say, too... My grandmother wouldn't like me saying that word to say. I don't know. What is it? What is this word that's so bad that I can't say it? Well, there's two. One, well, if I were going to bunt myself on base, I'd have three of the four letters necessary to describe one of the letters, or one of the words. And the other one, well, let's just say that white people used it to oppress a certain other color people for enough of a historical reference point that I refuse to not just let these words be spoken from my mouth, but hear them in mixed company. If ever those two words are spoken aloud, I ask not to ever hear them again, that I'm not trying to condemn you for your word choices in private, which this conversation would be, but if you are going to uh, assume that that word is okay with me, you are wrong. But everything else I let slide. Now, some things get commentary. I don't like to hear people use derogatory uh, racial terms ever. I don't like to hear belittling speech about women. I don't like to hear derogatory speech about anybody. And unfortunately, uh, my gender, especially in the locker room or in the men's room, can throw around some pretty harsh criticism of women or name your other subgroup. And standing up against that is always a, a quarrel. And I don't necessarily intervene in the middle of a public men's room at a goddamn Mexican food restaurant when two guys are talking about whatever Asian slur they may use. But sometimes I do, even in public. But when it comes to the workplace, oh, fuck. Fucking hate this shit. Because you work at a place with 150 employees, 100 of whom are male, and you're going to hear some seriously raunchy shit in the men's room. And as much as I can appreciate a good skewering joke, there's only so many <sighs> bitches and gold diggers commentary that I can accept before I have to tell you, you know, I thought maybe you were just being crass or having a bad day or doing your thing for the last three or four weeks that you've now revealed yourself as a complete misogynist. But what a misogynist is somebody whose commentary about women is always degrading, which is what you are and is how you comment. So now that I know that, I'm asking you to refrain from these type of comments when I'm in the men's room and to think seriously about your life and the reason that you are saying these things in general in public where people like I can hear them. So you have that conversation four or five times at work and it's not very comfortable after that. And 
So then why don't I work at a place with a higher level of cultural cachet? Well, <laughs> there is no such thing. The truth is that you work in a big box store, at least the, <clears throat> the unsubtleties are available to be seen. You work in an advertising agency and they just bury themselves until the company holiday festival with plenty of spiced rum to loosen up everybody's opinion of such a such social issue. Why am I wandering like this? I have no idea. I have no clue. Was this even on my list? Wander off into lands that you didn't intend to talk about? Yes, I guess it was on my list. So, now that we've crossed that off the list, maybe I should go back to the pussification of men. Um, one, one very interesting difference, I bet, and I don't know this because I've only thought this, never actually spoken these words to another human, so... Now that I'm speaking them to uh, my Android Galaxy S4 telephone, I still haven't spoken them to another human. But if you're listening to this, then in that rare instance, eh, I'm speaking to another human. And so here's a thought. When boys learn, not that girls have vaginas and boys have penises, not even that girls will grow up and have boobs and boys will grow up and have bigger penises, but it's the bleeding that fucking gets guys, we'll call it a buffered zone. And <clears throat> so what I was thinking is until that issue comes up, that women have periods, that they discharge uh, reproductive material and that they have special needs on a monthly basis because of this, this is so foreign to the boy experience that it turns girls into aliens. And vaginas don't do that because that's how it all has to fit so that we have babies. But the idea that you have maintenance? <laughs> uh, okay, alien. So early, whenever this point of information crystallizes for any boy, the girls become aliens. And because this is what girls are, they never really separate from boys. And I find, and it, but I mean, they pull back because of their special give birth uh, assignment. So there is that. I would hope that women feel a level of superiority in terms of gender responsibility um, because they have that. But at the same time, that's not separating yourself from the boys. That's almost admitting that whatever boys will be boys, girls still rule. And I'm not even sure I disagree with this. But what, what, it, what, what blows me away is that because boys have a point in life where girls will become aliens, there's a very definitive sense of we're not girls. We're not even close. We are different fucking creatures. And girls are their own thing. But I think girls never have that point of view from boys, except the distaste that they have for boys generally from the get-go. But that's not enough. That's just to think of boys as filthy girls or gross girls, which is what I think a lot of girls think of boys as. Because you think we think the same if you think they're gross girls. And we don't think the same at all. And we learn this early. And I'm learning now that there are plenty of 40, 50, and 60-year-old women who still think men and women have identical thinking tracks. And I can't believe how far in life they can get without understanding that that is fundamentally wrong. But this is just something to circle back on to think about what's going on with the boys today and their pussification. So...
Let me pause for a second because I gotta smoke even more weed. Pause. Um, pause, pause. Okay. Well, <laughs> shit. No, hang on, pause. Wait, am I paused? Okay. Oh, and I did remember what the fourth thing is. So I have a fourth thing. And no, it wasn't work. We're looking for work. Um, so why does this matter? Why does it matter that boys essentially develop early on the division between the sexes as clear and to the point that everything forward thinking men at that point live their lives out expecting is cooperation, partnership, yin yang, distribution of of connectivity. Um, and I'm not saying that, um, hmm, am I saying that? Maybe I am. I don't know. Okay. So, 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 so because there's this separation of, of even, hmm, um, societal contribution, like, I don't want to say that boys think in their heads that they can be, um, deadbeat dads, but deadbeat dads exist because there is a, there is the nominal uh, opportunity in every situation for the man to just say, no, fuck it, I'm out. Um, and it just seems like women don't have that trigger available. You can't just abandon your kids. Or you're a very rare woman if you can. But you're not that rare of a man if you can. Um, and And so... I think as we think through the implication of being the semen donors, not the uh, uh, cultivators of new life, uh, we realize that while we can't be neglected entirely from all of the equation, we can actively or passively play our role in ways that women can't. And I, I, I think you continue then to have a self-identity as a gender that you are different, you are accountable at different levels, you are working toward different things, and you are bringing different things to the table. This is all known. I don't necessarily know if women all gain that perspective the same way because men just aren't that different. They're just fucking weird. And so to me, I completely get why. And there's not enough sisterhood, unfortunately, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but it seems like there's, there's, there's not enough support woman to woman to woman to woman for the, um, for the pullback of, but we are the, we are the maternal energy. We, we do create the life. It is ours to carry. I mean, we do all the work. <laughs> no man would argue that you do all the work. Um, and yet the support, even taking into account things like the midwife structure or whatever, I just don't know that the support woman to woman to woman is blanket and compassionate and, um, and with sincerity. So, um, so I feel like what this ends up doing is it, it creates situations where you've got, um, men thinking they have as little skin in the game as is necessary, um, or defining themselves through the family unit isn't a given. Whereas a woman having a child is by definition defining her life. And I'm not saying this, this is not possible for men. It is entirely possible and, frankly, cultivated and likely. It's just not necessary. And, and, and in trying to figure out why this next generation behind me is coming up with almost a different model build, well, looking at gross generalizations is the first line of analysis to Penetrate. Bad, bad choice of verb. That was totally not meant to even be a joke. 
That just came out awful. Um, and again, let's stop with anything that has double entendre. If, if men have one thing going for them, I'm saying it's their sense of identity exists. And I'm not so certain the sense of identity exists for women other than the idea that we procreate, we give babies. Because so much of what I see from women still today is about appearing glamorous for men. And yes, I'm generalizing, but men also treat women in such a way that really what respect do we give you except as your worth as a sex object. So this societal give and take is so pervasive that we all fall prey to it in some capacity or another. And a lot of men and women are defined strictly by how much of the other sex's uh, validation they can achieve. Uh, me being one who chased all of that through my 20s and 30s. So when I know something about the male side of this, what I know is that it turns out it's a, a, an attempt to find the fulfillment that's missing from within yourself. And I'm sure it's the same for women. But we're thrown into the crock pot and <coughs> different, with different ingredients. Okay, I'm pause. All right, so, and these are just theories. I don't want to be presenting this as something that is um, is even um, stable. But if if there are places where I was wrong about feminism, it was that women weren't, didn't have power. Um, they didn't have power in the public sphere. And there's no question that the crimes of rape, stalking, harassment, whatever you want to say in a misogynistic society, men's brutal uh, aggression toward women represents, it's real and it exists and it is intensely uh, affecting of women and men, but way worse for women. And so all these things are real. And in, inside of these troubled uh, uh, barrels of nonsense is an urge to say no more, then no more, then no more. And my initial thought in all that as a man is, well, men, men's attitudes toward women have to change. <clears throat> and they do, that's fair. What, what happened in the 60s when essentially free love and uh, a new generation of sexual promiscuity was embraced in America, I'm speaking in America, um, you had an opportunity to rethink both sexes' roles and particularly, as it were, unshackle women from the bondage they had been in as the second sex. All of this is fair, but what was not noticed in this, well, men have been oppressing women paradigm of reality accepted by all who would consider themselves feminists, was the idea that, <clears throat> well, hang on a second, let's think about a world in which women are winning. What does that look like? Well, what do women most need? Well, simple. They need care at a time when their infant is most vulnerable. I think more than anything, that's what women most need. Because there will be a time in a woman's life with a brand new infant where neither one of them can care for themselves. And that's okay. The, the, the human infant is a terrible thing. <clears throat> I mean, its head's too big. It's, it's, there's so much wrong with the human infant that, uh, uh, here's a simple question. At what age do you think you could drop a, a child into the middle of uh, a city or the woods and they would survive? How old do they have to be? Seven, eight, 12, four, what age is it? I mean, four is sort of ridiculous, right? So that means there's at least four years of time where an infant is incapable of taking care of itself, if not arguably 12, 15, 80, the point is, we are born vulnerable to everything. And those who give birth are in just as vulnerable a state until they can freely let go of that which is now more important than they are 
the child they just gave birth to. So <clears throat> in a world where your biggest vulnerability is that moment of concept or moment of birth, not conception, uh, maybe for men, but if, <laughs> if you're going to create a society in which everything about that moment is cared for, well, in many ways, that's what women had in the fifties. Now I'm, shining a, a great big gloss across a lot of other problems. But the security of, A, primarily not having to work, although major exceptions occurred for that, especially among the poor, but, and B, having a structural safe environment in which to, uh, it, to create and nurture a family, and C, to have uh, enough representation through one mate or one partner to be able to attain these goals at pretty much all levels of society, even the working class, though there are major exceptions that should be footnoted, if not directly exposed. All of this said, what really happened with feminism was the workplace <laughs> um, opened up opportunities for better vacations, better couches, snazzier cars, bigger houses, whatever. If women got into the workplace, well, all of a sudden, the things that were just dreamt about when Mr. Man was coming home at 6 o'clock for dinner were now achievable. So the, the real push was the two-income house. And I don't know that feminism wasn't brought on specifically for that purpose by if I had to guess, white dudes in a fucking smoky cigar-filled room thinking about what they could do to make it even that much more chaotic. Because the yin and yang that existed in the family structure that said men do the work and, and bring home the bacon, as it were, and women take care of the home so that there's something to bring bacon home to, works. Worked well for both. Gave both an identity that was clear. Allowed a lot of cohesion amongst that, that knit group. And then that knit group had so much in common with its knit groups around it that those micro communities formed strength and power and voting integrity and communal integrity and cultural integrity. <clears throat> All of which is being lost today or is gone because we spend so much time working on the individual brand that we are now. I mean, how the fuck do men find any kind of peace in a world where literally two women living together are probably more stable as a family unit with the income they can bring in and with the acceptance culturally now of a lesbian relationship? Yeah, they have to go to the sperm bank to conceive, but that leaves men jacking off and fucking four by four rooms with Playboy magazines as basically what they've got left to give. And the idea that they can even find peace and harmony in becoming the breadwinner for, you know, the woman down the road? Fuck that. What, are you kidding me? <laughs> that shit's gone. And so the male crunch, the pussification of males today, the desperation of, well, maybe I can hitch my wagon to the right girl. Somewhat of that, I guess, was inevitable. And the idea that less men are graduating from college than women, less men are entering graduate programs than women, I mean, the shift is on. What used to be a fairly male-slanted uh, category of, of, of populace is directly slanting toward women and has only increased in doing so. Mostly because men are losing interest in fucking achieving anything in their lives. And so, as a guy who was fortunate enough for the last year, or some of the last year and a half, to work around a bunch of 20 and 30-something men, I saw uh, a resignation to a fate of misery or mediocrity, whichever M-word you want to throw in there that 
I didn't know could take over. And it, it isn't consuming everyone, but it's there in at least pieces for all of them. And sure, maybe I'm at the lower end of the talent pool, as it were, and my assessment is slanted by my sample, but I've been looking. I've been looking for those who are jumping forward with their motivation, their ideas, and their drive to do something here. Where are they? I can't find them except once in a while they breeze through the open mics and I think to myself, there's a champion right there. I can see it in their purpose. But most of them down there are scared as fuck. They're doing their last ditch thing hoping that this might be the thing that catches fire for them internally and makes life have purpose. You can see it. And 80% of them are admitting in real time that it's not working. And yeah, I know it's the century in which to inventory all your fucking maladies and tell everyone what's wrong with you. But you can, you can feel a sense of them dying inside as they explain the pain it is to realize they can't even connect here. And so where do they go? What do men do? I don't know. But that's what I'm going to think about for a little while here. I don't, I don't know. And I don't know that we haven't fucked it all up by retraining women as to thinking what they are. Because what they really are has always been the most valuable thing given. We just never gave it that kind of respect as men. So, of course, fighting back on men's terms, well, <clears throat> you've changed the entire landscape of where we are in a way that seems so counterintuitive compared to where it was headed with its intentions that you wonder if smarter than smart motherfuckers pulling the chains from way afar weren't watching the whole thing go down with glee. And I hope not, because, boy, does that ever sound uh, beyond the pale. But the way the world's going these days, it's hard to avoid those kinds of thoughts. So let's go to money next, right? Um, because <clears throat> money... Well, money doesn't exist. That's number one. Number two, we are conned into believing that there's only one way for goods and services to exist in an exchange of uh, unlike commodities and, and offerings to unlike commodities and offerings. You've got to have a way for everyone to be able to do their thing, get paid for it, and still be able to afford to buy the other things they need so that all this stuff has to work, right? Yeah, it does. It does. But... Do you know that the reason things were so fucked up when the European man met the Native American man was that the European man thought of things in ownerships uh, categories or uh, quantifications, and the Native Americans had no idea what that meant. There was no such thing as ownership. You are of the earth. If you choose to take that branch and turn it into a device on which you will place a marshmallow so you may toast it over a fire. Well, you don't own that branch any more than you own that marshmallow. These are all things that emerge in our reality for us to enjoy and become part of. We are, we are ingrained in all this. You don't own it. So as they would, in, as, as white people met native people, the native people were seeing that they needed whatever and would just give it to them and say, here, you need this. We're not using it. And then at the time when they would need it, they would come back and say, hey, you, you, we need it now. Because nobody owns anything. It's just a question of always exchanging what's in use versus what's not in use and putting it into use and making sure that things are being used as necessary by the people who need them. And that's how this entire continent existed for centuries, peacefully. They didn't know what money was. They knew what being of high character was. They knew what it meant to be sure that you're not the biggest voice in the room unless you're the biggest need in the room. And that as the biggest needs are being met, then the next needs are met, and therefore all needs can be met. And I don't, I don't begrudge 
the monetary system for its shenanigans, the ways that the private corporation known as the federal bank controls the entire money supply instead of we the people. Do you know how dumb that is? That we turn that over to somebody other than our collective good? But what are you going to do, right? That happened in 1913. That's over 100 years ago. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to watch the currency collapse again, like it does all the time. Just read history. And I don't mean American history. Read the world history. And watch what currency manipulation and financial shenanigans lead to. Boom and bust cycles that are predictable because they're being pulled from behind the scenes by people who make all the money that you can possibly imagine on these maneuverings. Our 80K a year salaries matter nothing at all except that they're not even enough to buy enough bread and circus entertainment for a family of four anymore. You better have two 80K salaries. Why is it that in this situation, the economy as it sits, almost every home with children has to have two working parents to be able to afford to live? That's ridiculous. It should be the opposite. Once you have kids, one parent should be staying home. Everyone's like, oh, that's a fucking pipe dream. Yeah, that's the pipe dream it was in the 50s. I, I mean, again, I'm just, there are better ways to be doing things than the ways we're doing them now. And money's part of the problem because money is a huge lever of power and control that needs to be established equitably across the populace. We can't have boom and bust cycles that favor those at the very top and the devaluing of assets that occurs in the bus cycles that allow them to hoard and concentrate resources at the very, very top. We're just asking for master-slave relationships and enabling them and then bitching about them when they happen. <sniffs> Humans. Okay, so that's my thought on money. And, I, and I, I currently have $9.30. I had 31 cents, but I lost the penny, so I have 30 cents. And hopefully I'll sell this bike tomorrow for 40 bucks. That'll give me some money. And hopefully I'll also sell this router that I paid $200 for. She'll give me 100 Yeah, fucking sucks. But whatever, right? If what you have to do to live in this environment is just survive and subsist on the least possible, well, then you're like me. I don't ever want to have more than $100 in the bank if I can help it. But the way prices are going now, I might have to add an extra zero to that. Anyhow, the way prices are going now has nothing to do with anything in the value of what goods are worth. It's just manipulating the system so that you'll stay stressed out enough that you'll keep working. Which you will. Which I will too. What are you going to do? Buck the entire system? Stand on the corner and explain to them that you're not crazy? That you just think things could be better? Well, that doesn't pay very well, so hopefully people start throwing you food and shelter and energy. Okay. The third thing I was going to talk about was stand-up. But why don't we get to that last, because then I can talk about the fourth thing, third. And the fourth thing is that, well, I mean, maybe, uh, you never know, zone that occurs between men and women. So I'm going to pause and take some serious pockets for this one. Okay, this next little part of the discussion is being brought to you by Granddaddy Perps. Vaporizer style. Um, and mango kush, because, you know, why not? Okay. Um, hmm. First of all, I have to give credit to this concept. Not that this exists, but the conversation that I heard on a podcast from a woman named Danny Katz, who I've spoken about one other time on this uh, recording before. So, being the only media material I've spoken about twice on this recording, uh, we will now say is worth your time. There's something to be gleaned from any conversation that two people with intelligent takes and uh, willingness to push uh, uh, social mores uh, provides. I don't care who it is. You should listen. At least... Uh, 
especially if the opposing viewpoints are different than your own. And uh, it's just good for your mind. Danny Cass is good for your mind. And I don't remember who the woman was she was speaking with, so I apologize for that. But the conversation they were having was in reference to the misogynistic dynamic of power and how you can live in certain zones of grayness until they have to be defined as, nope, that's not happening. And this intrigued me in the way that women think about this because even I, and I would be willing to say most men, find every heterosexual woman out there at least accessible in terms of procreation. I hate to say this because this makes us, and I'll just speak for myself. I don't want to speak for another single man in the universe. But because there are only probably one out of 30 women who, for a variety of reasons, it's never really physical, but will just become non-candidates. That means 29 out of 30 are. And it's not that you're thinking about it. You just know if it came down to it, it could happen if that was going to save the human race. And I hate to say that men think this way, but given what men have to do, which is basically put as much seed out there as they can, and that's their only job, of course they think like this. And women don't. <laughs> at all. So, circling back to where I said, if you don't understand that men and women have very different thoughts, literally structure, the, the, if, if you told us to both go build a high-rise, yours comes out very different than ours. Think of our mental framework as being that unique between the sexes. There's just differences. And this is one of them. Now, what's interesting to me is that as far as women are concerned, there are multiple studies that prove that in, say, a random sample of um, 50 online candidates, male versus 50 online candidates, female, cross uh, the, the Internet uh, boundaries and start communicating with those you're interested in. Well, <clears throat> out of the 50 women, they will center in on roughly four to five men, all of them. And then four or sometimes as few as three of them will actually branch out to other men. Which means that there is this entire <laughs> uh, gray zone for women of offering to four or so men that they think, well, sure, maybe. I mean, if he was divorced and was just driving that convertible around, I might ask for a ride home. But... 46 of them are non-candidates, period. And would have to do a lot to even get into the maybe group. But the maybe group of guys, those four dudes, are fucking everybody. Literally. And because you're giving them offers for pussy left and right, they're not going to say no enough to not fucking take you up on it eventually. I mean, my point is... <laughs> This is another pr problem, is that women have basically trained themselves to want and to really accept the advances of only that top 10%, which is fine. If you're a woman who's having babies, you want the absolute best home that can possibly provide that whole scenario. But what happens to you then? What happens to you when inevitably, even if you get that guy who can't help but get three other offers that are almost as good, if not better, in the next three years? I don't know. Like, this is tough. This is tough. Because what about all those men that immediately become non-candidates? What have they done wrong? What, what? Why aren't they up in their game? Why aren't they in the top 10%? Like, what? some of that has to be fucking... Look, I'm not going to buy bad fucking tomatoes if all you're selling are bad tomatoes. What do you want me to do? 
I'd rather go to the sperm bank. Uh-huh. So what's men's identity here? I'm just, these are some of the things that make me think, like, well, so these gray zones that Miss Katz was talking about, I live in them with almost all women. <laughs> I hate to say it. But not in an overt way, just in, I like to flirt. I mean, fuck, it's just, there's something about the male-female dynamic that's, I don't know, it's fun. It's not serious. It's not something that I really think about. But if you're going to make me think about it, like the whole pussification of men and how men are losing an identity entirely as having value from within, and how is this occurring? Well, I certainly don't see a lot of the younger cohorts of my generation very nimble when it comes to the male-female dynamic of semi but really not flirting flirting. It's straight-up cold, calculated conversation of purpose or awkwardness. Not much in between. And when they do go into this territory, they're so poor at it. I literally pulled a few to the side and said, you got to understand why that's out of line. And again, if this doesn't get practiced, if you're not comfortable in these zones, if you can't go up to a woman you don't know and speak to her with some level of confidence and authority that you're worth speaking to, Again, this is this is something I wasn't good at until I became better at it, and then I got confident at it, and now I feel very capable at it. But I also know what lines are crossed and drawn, apparently more than most men, and am very sensitive to whatever feedback I would get that might be something bristling. I've crossed a line or two unintendedly, only to have to pull back and apologize profusely for not knowing I'd been in that kind of territory, but... Learn, live and learn. I I don't even consider these to be examples in which I would want to hold back from being a vivacious conversationalist. And so, <sighs> that gray zone in which I keep people, I think I'm going to stop. The next time I am secure in the sense that I should never, ever sleep with this person, I think I might even tell them that. <laughs> I know this sounds awful. I know it sounds awful. I know it sounds awful. But in a premise to say, but I value you so much that if you don't think I want to be your friend for life, forever, for eternal time, you're wrong. I just know that with my emotional uh, wind sail thrown up in a direction in which I'm not sure how the wind will blow, I can become the problem. And I never want that to happen here. So, for the first time in my life, I'm officially friending you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll rethink this. I'm not saying I'm sold on it. There could be uh, an opportunity here to be smarter than I'm currently being, I'm sure. So, throwing it into the wind so that that sail can bounce around before I actually do it in public. All right, last but not least, stand-up comedy. <sighs> I told myself July was piss or get off the pot month in terms of developing a voice, and I actually think I do have a voice, I actually do think I have a purpose, I actually do think I, I have something to say, but I also think I have long-form ideas, I also think I have something that borders on, uh, hmm, on social commentary as much as comedy. And I don't know what to do. So I guess the thing to do is to throw out what I believe in most for the next two and a half weeks, whatever, till the end of July. I guess it's two weeks now. Because today's July 15th, if I haven't mentioned that. And it's currently uh, 10.45 in the evening. And I've been recording off and on for the last couple hours. So thanks for putting up with it. But that's not something that I can count on in a open mic format. And tomorrow night's open mic would be the hardest one to start with. Fuck, man. But I gotta start there, don't I? Or maybe I finished there the last two Sundays? God, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I... I suppose learning something about myself in this process is... at least half of why I'm in it. If not more. But... for the first time... ever... ever... in my life... I'm starting to debate whether or not 
the stand-up comedy stage is the stage on which I'm supposed to emerge. I've always thought it was. So this could just be a little bit of doubt as I start to really um, dive in full force. I'm not sure. But I thought telling you the things I'm not sure about was a good way to end this. Because uh, once again, I felt a little preachy in this one. <laughs>